Um, thank you all for joining us uh, for Hatfield's Marine Science Center's research seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt and I'm the research program manager at Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon, and I'll be your host today. Um, a couple little logistics. I wanted to let everyone know that their mics, cameras, and screen shares have been turned off. If you could help us out by keeping it that way for the duration of this seminar, that would be really helpful. We do ask that you um, communicate with us using chat. Um, and so that's the little box at the bottom. Um, and you're welcome to put in questions at any time and we'll answer those at the end. Um, wanted to just do a few quick announcements here. We have um, next week's seminar. Uh, excuse me, uh, I'm looking for the researcher's name, uh, Kiva Oken, who is from the University of California, Davis, who will be talking about ecological interactions among fish populations in the California current. So if you'd like to know more about that or about other um, upcoming events at Hatfield, feel free to Google HMSC or Hatfield um, and scroll down to the bottom of our homepage and you will find out more information um, and get links for all of those types of events. But for today, um, I wanted to uh, welcome Dr. Athena Rizik. She is a professor of biology and marine science at the New College of Florida. She has her bachelor's in biological physiology from New College of Florida and her master's and PhD in biological oceanography from Florida State University. Um, Dr. Rizik specializes in serenian biology, including manatee boat interactions, sensory capabilities and vocal communication. And her research really stresses the use of objective and reproductive or reproducible computational methods to extract behavioral and acoustical signals in large data sets. She was invited today by Hatfield Sandra Bond, so we're really excited to have her. So Dr. Rizik does not have a camera today, um, so just know that you will hear her wonderful voice and see her great slides, but you will not be able to see her face. Um, but I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Rizik now. The floor is yours. Take it away. All right, thank you for that introduction and thank you for having me today. Uh, so I'm very excited to talk about manatees in a site based in Oregon, since that's probably not something you guys get to hear about often, but they're very interesting creatures. So what I'm going to talk about today is a combination of a review and a primary article um, that I've been working on with a group of colleagues. And our goal is that we set out to try to synthesize manatee hearing and behavior research, both in a laboratory setting and those that have been conducted in the field to try to apply it to the problem of manatee boat collisions. So basically what we're going to be talking about is what do we know about how manatees detect and react to boats and also what remains to be known. So we're a large group representing several institutions. So there's myself, I'm at New College of Florida. There's also Roger Reap, Joe Gaspard, Debbie Colbert-Luke, Doug Noachek, Chip Deutsch, David Mann, Randy Wells, and Gordon Bauer. And feel free to type questions in chat if you have them along the way. I'll try to keep an eye on that chat window. All right. So let's start by touching on why manatee mortality from boat collisions is an important issue. Overall, boat collisions account for about a third of manatee mortality in Florida. However, this isn't evenly distributed across AIDS classes. So here we see proportion of manatee deaths that are compared to manatee body length, and then the cause of death is indicated by color. So red is the one that we're interested in. These are manatee mortalities that were attributed to a watercraft collision. If we look at the plot on the right, where the calf, subadult, and adult classifications compare to manatee body length, we see that indicated. Basically, if you look at this plot on the right, the important takeaway message from this plot is how that red grows with body length. Adult manatees are more likely to die from a boat collision than other causes of death. If we average within the adult age class, we see that half of manatee mortality is a result of a boat collision. This is really important. For those of you who are unfamiliar with population modeling, the adult age class is particularly important, especially for a long-lived, slowly reproducing species. The long-term outlook for manatees is particularly sensitive to adult survival rates. And the underlying reason is simple. 
adult manatees can make more manatees. They're reproductively mature. They've overcome the hurdles of youth and they can contribute to their species. So this means adult survival is very important for the longevity of the species. And when we look at this plot, we see that boat collisions are the greatest threat to adult manatees. Even small changes in adult survival rates can impact the long-term outlook for manatees. So I hope I've established why understanding manatee boat collisions uh, is important. Now we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about sound and hearing, and that's because sound is likely the first and most important way for a manatee to detect an approaching boat. So let's just start talking about manatee hearing with a look at the auditory system. In short, do they have what it takes to hear an approaching boat? And a good starting point for answering a question like that is to look at an organism's brain. This can tell us what's likely important to a manatee. The more area of a brain devoted to a sensory system, the more likely it is that it's important to them. And when we look at the manatee brain, there's two areas that are disproportionately represented. There's the area for somatosensory, not of interest to us today, and then there's the areas for auditory information processing. So, and we'll, we see this represented, the presumptive auditory cortex in green on the figure in the bottom left. So this is part of the temporal lobe in the area where the highest level auditory processing occurs, and this is rather large in manatees. Components of the auditory system leading up to the cortex are also large. So we can look at, for example, the inferior colliculus. This is in the midbrain, and this is something that helps integrate auditory information from different channels. This is large. Also the auditory vestibular nerve, known as the eighth cranial nerve. You can see that in the bottom right picture, the blue arrows are pointing to it. It's also relatively large in manatees. And part of its function is delivering information from the inner ear uh, via the cochlear nerve. So it's also enlarged, indicating that maybe it can carry a lot of information. So altogether, if we look at the auditory system, it appears to be well-developed in manatees. However, auditory processing is complicated, and it's the result of multiple processes. So hearing also needs to be behaviorally measured, rather than solely inferring it from anatomy, because sometimes we're surprised if we rely solely on anatomical inferences. Now, manatee hearing sensitivity at a range of frequencies has been tested in a laboratory setting. But before I show you those results, you might be wondering how do you actually test manatee hearing? So let me show an example. So the procedure that was used in this particular study was a go, no-go procedure. So this means if the manatee hears a sound, it does something, which in this case is gonna be pushes a paddle. If it doesn't hear something, then it doesn't do that. And you actually might've completed something similar at a doctor's office where your hearing was tested. Like they play tones and they ask you to raise your hand or sometimes they give you that little clicker thing and you press a button. It's the same idea with manatees. So let's go ahead and watch a video of two trials. The first one is going to have no sound stimulus, so the manatee should remain at station. So that initial sound is telling the manatee to station, so it goes and it rests under that PVC frame. On the right, that little tiny light just went off. That lets the manatee know that a trial has started. The speaker to the left is going to remain silent because in this particular trial there's no stimulus. That whistle is a bridge, letting the manatee know it did good. And then a magical hand will appear and feed the manatee to reward it. So let's go ahead and watch a stimulus trial. All right, so the manatee knows to go station. You'll see the tiny light on the right go on. The speaker plays a high frequency sound. And then the manatee correctly responds by going and touching the paddle. And then the manatee is rewarded. So you repeat that procedure again and again for different frequencies of different sound amplitudes. And after doing that a whole lot of times, you can plot what's called an audiogram. So that's what we're looking at here. This is an audiogram uh, that has results from two different studies. Now, audiograms can be a little tricky to interpret because usually when we're looking at a plot, 
higher means better, but it's the opposite in audiograms. The y-axis is the sound level threshold. In other words, that's how loud something has to be in order for the manatee to detect it. So this means lower is better when we're looking at an audiogram. It's kind of like if you've ever watched agility courses, you might have seen horses or dogs or even bunnies run agility courses and they have to jump over those bars. The bar is a threshold. The lower the bar, the less energy it takes. So same idea here. On the x-axis, we then have the frequency of all those tested sounds and it's using a logarithmic scale. So the results that we see here are for four manatees across two different studies. And then we also have the background noise plotted from each of those studies for reference. That's important to include. Of course, when you're doing acoustic work like this, you try to minimize background noise, but you can never fully eliminate it. So we have plots of the background noise level here to give you kind of some background information. So what the important takeaway message from this, if you look at the four manatees, is that the shape and the frequencies of highest sensitivities, which would be the lowest part, closely agree across manatees and studies. So the first study by Gerstein et al. in 1999, they categorized peak frequency as 6 to 20 kilohertz, and Gaspard had a similar range of 8 to 32 kilohertz. Now, audiograms are conducted under ideal conditions where you're trying to keep everything quiet. You're trying to minimize background noise. But of course, out in a natural environment, there's a lot of background noise that can potentially mask a sound of interest. Just like how if you go to a party, it's a little loud and you're trying to talk to someone next to you, there's a lot of noise that might mask that. Critical ratios provide an estimate of that ability to hear sound in the presence of background masking noise, and it estimates critical bandwidth. So specifically, a critical ratio is the difference in sound level of a just detectable tone and the spectrum level broadband noise, the background. So Gaspard and colleagues uh, measured hearing sensitivity of continuous tones for selected frequencies between 4 and 32 kilohertz, since that's the frequencies they found that they were most sensitive to. Uh, the masking was then created by having a one octave wide noise band centered around that test tone frequency. And this used a similar experimental setup as the audiogram. The researchers tested different test tone frequencies and level of masking noise. And after many trials, you can then determine what their critical ratios are. Now for comparison, the dashed line represent the 10% energy curve, and most mammals tend to fall around this, so this gives you a little bit idea of how they compare to other species. And then we also have the plus signs, which are bottlenose dolphins, so another way to compare. So just like in the audiograms, lower values are better. A lower critical ratio indicates that the test tone doesn't have to be as loud to be detected in the presence of background noise. So overall, the manatees' critical ratios are very good. They indicate good sensitivity to being able to detect sounds of interest in noise. And actually, the manatees' critical ratio at 8 kilohertz was among the lowest measured in manatees. So this means they can likely hear well in noisy environments. All right, but we need to go further. <laughs> Critical ratios, they indicate the energy required for detection at the frequency of a tested tone. However, auditory systems are organized as band filters. You need a certain level of acoustic energy within each filter to activate and detect that there's a sound. A critical ratio test used a tone and then broadband noise to mask it. But the band filter is actually much wider than that discrete test tone. So if you're interested in the detection of broadband sounds, like boat noise, which we're interested in, then the energy needed, to, needed for detection can actually be spread out across that band. In other words, you don't need as much energy at a particular frequency within that band. Broadband sounds are easier to detect than tones. So here, David Mann adjusted the tone-based audiogram thresholds lower using critical ratios to estimate broadband detection thresholds. That's the purple line. 
So this means the adjusted audiogram serves as an estimate of the ability to hear broadband sounds that would be similar to boat noise. Now, as I mentioned earlier, of course, their natural environment also has other acoustic things going on. It's kind of noisy out there. So the gray busier line is the natural soundscape that was recorded in Sarasota Bay to just serve as a reference here. So keep in mind that our lower threshold still equals better. So what we should be looking at on this plot is to compare where the purple line is relative to the gray. Where the purple line is lower than the Sarasota Bay soundscape, this means manatee sensitivity is likely below the level of background noise. So the important takeaway from this plot is that the purple line and background noise line cross at 2.5 kilohertz. This means detection of boat sound below 2.5 kilohertz. Detection is going to be limited by hearing sensitivity. We can see that because below 2.5 kilohertz, that purple line is above background noise level. Whereas above 2.5 kilohertz, detection is going to be limited by background noise. And we can tell that because the purple line is below the background noise level. Now, in the last slide, I showed a representative background noise level sample. However, this is only from one location at one time. And background noise is dynamic. It varies across locations and time of day and season and even years. So we would like to better describe how background noise varies. So we're planning to use acoustic data that's collected from the Sarasota Bay's PALS network, which is a, a network of passive acoustic listening stations that are um, solar powered and they're land based around the edges of Sarasota Bay. You can see a map here. Uh, so we've been collecting baseline data with this network for a while now, and we're going to be using data from that to basically get a better idea of background noise levels and how it varies from locations. So in the future, we're going to be able to incorporate that uh, new information in as well. All right. So we've been talking about hearing. Now let's actually bring in boats into the picture and look at the frequency content of boat noise and compare frequency content and sound level of boats traveling at different speeds. I'll bring back that adjusted uh, broadband uh, sound detection limits to compare in just a minute. So here we have frequency in kilohertz versus spectrum level. For all of these boat passes, it's important to know that the same boat was used for all of these passes. The color represents the speed color of the passes. So we have a yellowish gold for slow, orange is an intermediate speed, and blue is fast. The plot's animated, and it's going to show how frequency content and spectrum level, that is how loud it is, of these approaching boats change as it moves towards the hydrophone. In each of these cases, the boat drove directly at the hydrophone coming within one meter of it. So I'm going to play it, and then I'm going to point out a couple things. All right, so the blue fast boat ends up loudest at CPA. And by CPA, I mean the boat's closest point of approach. Now that's not surprising, of course. But what I want you to notice is when I replay that is it doesn't start out above the others. 10 seconds out, the slow gold boat is actually similar or even louder than the other speed categories because it's much closer to the hydrophone. This is an important point. While slow boats are quieter, they're heard earlier. Whoops. Okay. <laughs> so now just to bring back in what we were talking about before, here's the audiogram adjusted for broadband detection in purple. Above a few hundred hertz, the majority of boat noise is likely audible to a manatee in advance of the CPA. So both the slow and fast boats produce sound in excess of the adjusted broadband detection thresholds. Now, one proposed hypothesis for manatee boat collisions is that manatee hearing may be limited when they're near the water surface, which of course they're going to, as mammals, they're going to have to frequently visit to breathe. So here we compare an approaching boat recorded at 15 centimeters depth to simulate if a manatee was at the surface breathing. 
that's the top plot. And then the bottom plot is the same boat pass, but it was recorded one meter down. The boat used is pictured in the bottom right, just to give you an idea. It's uh, basically a small recreational vehicle that was traveling at 10.7 miles per hour. And it drove at the hydrophone, approaching within about a meter of it. So here I added a golden line to demarcate 2.5 kilohertz. You might recall that when the background noise of Sarasota Bay was compared to the broadband detection thresholds, that manatee detection of boat noise below 2.5 kilohertz is likely limited by hearing sensitivity, but that above this, a manatee likely is only limited by background noise. So look above the golden line. For both the 15 centimeter and the one meter depth, you can clearly distinguish the sound of an approaching boat from the background, and you can do so far in advance of the boat CPA. That is its closest point of approach. Another observation is that you can see that there are spectral dif differences in the acoustic signal between the two depths. This is because sound reflects off the water surface and interferes with the sound's propagation. So this causes signal attenuation, particularly for the lower frequencies. This is known as the Lloyd mirror effect. Overall, the boat is quieter near the surface and also it kind of takes on like a tinny quality. So let's go ahead and listen to uh, listen to some excerpts of this. So we're gonna look, listen to the portion between the blue lines. So let's start with 15 centimeters depth. And now let's listen to what it sounds like at one meter depth. So we can hear that there's differences. That 15 centimeter depth, it's a little quieter, and it also has a little bit of a different quality to it. But both our visual and our auditory examination of what a boat sounds like at these two different depths, they do support that it's of course different, but not necessarily that manatees can't detect a boat when they go to the surface to breathe. And we can see that in an example from the wild too. So, this is a reconstruction of an actual boat pass recorded from a tag that was attached to a manatee. And I'll briefly explain these methods in a couple slides. So the manatee is represented by the, the reddish um, symbol in the center. It's a sphere with a triangular shaped wedge attached to it. And that wedge is gonna point in the direction of the manatee's heading. You'll be able to follow along with the manatee's heading speed and depth on the right. The manatee is also color coded so that when it's near the surface, it's reddish. That also means that it's in the most potential of danger from a boat collision. And then it fades to white if it goes down in the water column. You can see green, that's showing that there's some seagrass beds in the area. And then running a little off center to the left is a deep water channel. It's a boat channel that the manatee is about to swim into. What you're going to see is a black sphere appear near the top. That's a boat traveling in that channel, and we'll see it approach the manatee. So the manatee is moving a little bit. It's moving into the channel. You can see the boat appear. You can start to hear the boat. And when the manatee started to hear the boat, it sent the into the water. Even though the manatee did start near the surface, where it does have to contend with the Lloyd mirror effect to detect the boat, it did detect the boat and it sunk in the water column to a deeper, safer depth. And let's consider another example. So this is actually the same manatee in the same location. <laughs> Only three minutes later, it decided to hang out in that boat channel for a little bit, but it's away from the surface and another boat's gonna go by it. So it's already deep. It's about three meters deep. It's safe. It doesn't, uh, so it doesn't go up or down much, but it does change its heading some as it seems to detect the boat. It moves away a little bit. So in both cases, the boat is audible in the first pass, even though it's near the surface, and also when they're deeper in the water column. And we have lots of examples of this happening where the manatee, when it's near the surface, is still able to detect boats. And that was a finding of a paper that looked at um, hundreds of different boat passes. 
So thus far, we've only been looking at detection of boat noise. And while that's of course important, that's only part of what is needed for a manatee to successfully avoid a boat collision. It also needs to be able to localize where the boat is coming from so that it can respond in an effective manner. So Colbert Luke and others conducted an eight choice localization study in a laboratory setting. So there's eight speakers that are arranged around the manatee. You can see the diagram in the upper right, so the yellow speakers. They're all arranged all around the manatee, evenly spaced apart. Uh, so a sound would play out of one of those speakers, and then the manatee would have to indicate which, which speaker it came from. So let's look at an example. So there's that stationing sound again, the manatee stations. One of the speakers is going to play a sound. The manatee detects which speaker that is, swims towards it, it's going to boop the speaker. And then we have that bridge indicating that that was the right choice. And so the manatee is going to come back and be rewarded for that. So this is repeated again and again, moving the sound to different speakers until you can um, determine what their accuracy is for sound localization. So that's the results that we're looking at here. So now we're averaging across all of those eight choices and we're looking at results for a broadband signal that spans 0.2 to 24 kilohertz. In other words, something somewhat similar to boat noise that's also broadband. The top row indicates the duration and sound level of the signal, and then each row below shows the percent correct for that condition for each manatee. It's important to keep in mind that the manatee was presented with eight choices, so this means chance level of selecting the correct speaker is 12.5%. So the manatees are well above chance level. Now, they found a difference in accuracy based on the location of the sound source relative to the manatee. So here we average across, uh, across the speakers such that you're either looking at speakers in the front, to the sides, or behind the manatee. So the manatee actually performs better when the sound source is in front of them. And this might be because when the speaker's behind them, they can't actually see it. Their visual field is oriented forward. So they wouldn't actually have enough time to turn around and visually see the sound source. And that might be one of the reasons why they weren't performing as well on the speakers behind them. Meaning manatees might use visual orienting to help them localize. That's something that we do too. And that's a cue that's not likely to be available to a manatee when a boat's approaching it, at least not until it's very close and doesn't have much time left to respond. Now, it's important to consider how these results apply to situations in the wild. So in the experiment, the sounds, are presented, uh, the sounds that are presented are discrete. However, boats produce ongoing noise that acts like a beacon. And there's also feedback between sensation and motor actions. You turn towards a sound, which then provides new localization cues. And there's these ongoing adjustments with integration of information across sensory and motor feedback systems. So the more time a manatee has, likely the better it will be able to localize the source. So the study actually demonstrates good sound localization under circumstances that are likely to underestimate the manatee's localization abilities for boats. All right. So now let's take it a step further and move into the field where things are even more complicated. So in the lab, the manatees were trained to attune to specific sound related tasks at hand. And you know, they're focused on that task. There's not all these other distracting things going on. But in the wild, they're eating and resting and traveling and socializing. And acoustically, it's a lot more complicated too. So in the wild, they're not in a controlled environment. However, observing manatees in the wild, specifically their responses to boats, is very difficult. They live in turbid water, so there's a water clarity issue. Also, uh, boats produce wakes that are going to visually occlude the manatee. Uh, so it can be very difficult to see the manatee under these circumstances. And then even if you see them, you're likely not going to notice small changes. You would only notice very large movements. And some previous studies ran into these problems and would have to exclude a lot of their boat passes because of those concerns. 
Uh, so myself and some colleagues decided to put behavioral monitoring tags and attach them directly to manatees. So we attached D tags and GPS tags to wild manatees and then re-release them back into their environment. And then we mapped the boat activity around them. So what the D tag is measuring is the manatee's depth, its heading, its pitch, its roll, and the acoustic environment. So this is an example of a reconstruction of a manatee's behavior and boat activity around them from that study. So we're gonna look at a 16 minute period of time that's sped up so that it's playing 15 times normal speed. And this is to give you an idea of the kinds of difficult situations that manatees can encounter. So again, our manatee is that sphere with a triangular shaped wedge and it's color coded. You're going to see black spheres which represent different boats. The bathymetry in this case is color coded based on depth. So that darker blue running down the center means that it's a deep boat channel. And then those lighter blue areas to the side are very shallow. Uh, they're actually can sometimes be exposed during low tide. So this presents an, a situation where the manatee has limited options. So let's watch the life of a manatee. Maybe. Okay, there it goes. <laughs> All right, so that boat is traveling on a plane just to give you an idea of speed. So you can observe that the manatee makes subtle adjustments to the boats. It'll stop fluking, it'll lower in the water column, it'll move away. And these subtle changes in behavior are possibly examples of a manatee learning to avoid these frequent disturbances while limiting their energy expenditure. So that boat was traveling slowly and then speeds up once it got to the channel. And those two boats you might notice actually slowed down a little bit. So boats can affect manatee behavior and manatees can also affect boat behavior. They were the, those boats actually saw the brightly colored GPS buoy attached to the manatee and slowed down a little bit to watch the manatee as they passed by. So let's start with a basic question. In the field where things are complicated, do manatees respond to boats? Manatees, of course, change their behavior even in the absence of disturbances. So for this reason, a particular change in behavior can never be absolutely determined to be a reaction to a boat, as the manatee might have just made that change even if there was no boat pres present. However, a higher frequency in changes in behavior when a boat is close compared to times without a boat nearby can determine if more changes are likely to occur when a boat is near. So these plots are showing the average rate of changes in roll, depth, heading, and fluking behavior for three different categories. The category on the left, the bars on the left, include times when a boat approached within 50 meters of the manatee. The middle bars are when there were boats around, but they weren't within 50 meters of the manatee. And then on the right, we have times when there was no boat noise audible. Oops. And what we found is that there was higher rates of changes in roll, depth, heading, and fluking behavior during these close boat periods of time. So this means that while a particular change in behavior can't be directly attributed to a boat's presence, some changes are clearly related to the presence of a close boat. This strongly counters the idea that manatees can't detect boats and that they don't respond to them. We also learned that manatees encounter a lot of boats. <laughs> so manatees on average had a boat within 500 meters of it 26 and a half times per hour with a maximum of 118 boats per hour that we observed. Now, a boat that remains hundreds of meters away from the manatee, that's of course not at risk of striking the manatee. However, it may still be audible to the manatee and able to mask the sound of closer potentially more threatening boats. Manatees were approached by a boat within 50 meters once or twice an hour. They were approached within 10 meters on average every 3.3 hours. 
And I should point out that these averages are calculated across different habitats. So this includes animals that are just, you know, tucked away at the back of a canal away from boats. And it also includes manatees that are like basically set up and spend hours next to a boat channel. There's a very big difference in encounter rates depending on what environment they're in. So the rates of manatee boat encounters is not just important from the perspective of a boat collision, but again, that perspective of masking. More boats with an acoustic range of a manatee means more potential for masking, which boat is the greatest threat. And I'll circle back to that idea later. So now if we shrink our consideration to only boat passes within 10 meters of the manatee, uh, what we found is that manatees change their behavior 89% of the time in these very close boat passes. This included changes in fluking, heading, depth, and roll. So 89% is a high rate, and I think it's important to keep in mind that that missing 11% could also just represent situations when not changing your behavior is a prudent response. If you're already out of the way or you're deeper in the water column, when we looked at the type of first change in behavior for these closed boat passes, we found that fluking was the most common first change in behavior. And this was usually an increase in their fluking rate. Also of interest is that the times of first behavioral change were very similar between slow and fast passes. But as you'll see in a little bit, there is a difference in the timing of changes in behavior based on boat speed. So boat speed is the factor that most affected how long a manatee had to respond to an approaching boat. So we're restricting boats passes to those that were within 50 meter of the manatee for this particular figure. What we're looking at on the y-axis is the time of first behavioral change relative to a boat's CPA, which is its closest point of approach. So what this means is that a negative number means the manatee changed its behavior before the boat reached its closest point of approach. So that red line is showing you when CPA is zero, which means the boat has reached the manatee, you're out of time. So we then split based on boat speed. So we have boats traveling on a plane and boats traveling slowly. So what we found is that manatees approached by a slow boat typically change their behavior much earlier relative to CPA than when approached by a boat on a plane. So you may recall from a few slides ago that slow boats are audible before fast boats, and it appears to translate into manatees responding earlier to slow boats. And responding earlier may provide a manatee more time to reach a safe location before the boat reaches it. For example, if it's trying to seek out a deep water channel, having more time to respond will potentially let it reach that safer location. And it also might allow the manatee to respond in a more energetically favorable manner. So another hypothesis about why manatee boat collisions occur suggests that manatees don't have enough time to respond after it first detects a boat. And this is going to relate to boat speed. So let's bring data together from two different studies. So here we see time for change in green. What that means is how long a manatee has to respond until a boat reaches it. These values come from the field measurements of those D tags that were actually attached to the manatee. The orange line is from recordings of boats in Sarasota Bay, and we looked at some examples earlier. And we're looking at peak sound level and then comparing it to average boat speed across the path. And they did keep, they maintained a consistent boat speed across that pass. And what we see is that even though fast boats are louder, they allow less time for a manatee to respond to an approaching boat because it reaches the manatee quickly. Slow boats, on the other hand, while quieter, can be heard much sooner. So even though slow boats are quieter and not heard until they're closer to the manatee, they typically allow substantially more time for manatee to respond before CPA. So maybe in some cases, a manatee simply doesn't have enough time to respond, even if it can locate the boat and localize it and it has a response plan, it might not have enough time to actually execute it. And this would be particularly difficult for fast moving boats that don't allow the manatee as much time to respond. So then fast boats present this other issue that I hinted at early, which is masking. 
So let's consider a scenario. So this is an actual Google Earth image that I pulled to show that this is a real scenario that manatees encounter. Uh, now from the DTAG study, we can actually estimate how far away a boat can be heard in natural conditions that the manatees actually sampled for us. So let's assume that these boats are traveling fast. So here we have five boats that we could see from the Google Earth image. These red circles represent to scale the estimated area a boat traveling 29 miles per hour can be heard. Uh, so now already you can get a sense of how acoustically this could be very confusing. There's boat after boat and then trying to recognize when a boat has left the channel to approach you would be very challenging. You've probably become used to just kind of having this constant boat noise while you're just sitting on a seagrass bed for a long period of time. And what we found in the DTAG study is that multiple boat passes were very common, meaning that more than one boat can be heard at a time. Now let's consider if a slow moving boat leaves, uh, leaves the marina that's kind of in the bottom right. And it's headed straight for our manatees. The manatees are not to scale, by the way. So <laughs> this boat's traveling slowly, can't be heard as far away. You can see how boat traffic in the channel could potentially mask and confuse the sound of the boat that's on a collision course with the manatee. Now, if we slow down the boats in the channel, this could greatly reduce that area of masking. So let's take those boats from 29 to 20 miles per hour. So shrinking to that orange color is then the, the estimated area, the estimated distance that those boats can be heard if they're traveling 20 miles per hour. So this is a big decrease in the area of potential masking. I think it's important for us to consider that separating slow speed zones and fast speed zones for boats doesn't isolate the sound of fast boats. Those fast boats can still be heard in those slow speed, no wake zones and maybe masking the approach of closer boats and could also impact the manatee's ability to localize an approaching boat. And then if a boat collision does occur, boat speed is gonna be a primary factor that determines if a boat collision will be fatal for the manatee. So here are data from uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife, their ma uh, marine mammal pathobiology lab that, does, that has a necropsy program. So manatees that were determined to die from a watercraft collision are shown here, but then they're further subdivided based on whether mortality was attributed to sharp wounds inflicted by a boat's propeller and or blunt trauma caused by the impact of a boat collision. So of those manatees that died from watercraft collisions, most are a result of an injury caused by impact rather than sharp wounds caused by the propeller. And impact force is going to be a function of the amount of energy that's transferred from the boat to the manatee in a collision. And so we can consider the kinetic energy of a moving object and consider that it increases exponentially with its velocity. So in short, fast boats have more energy to transfer to a manatee in a collision, therefore can cause more damage and therefore increase the chance of mortality. So let's bring this all together. So in general, we found that manatees can hear boats. We have laboratory studies of hearing abilities that suggest this. And then we have confirmation from multiple field studies that manatees react to boats. In general, manatees are likely able to localize the sound of boats. Their localization capabilities were good in a laboratory study that likely estimated their sound localization abilities. Studies have found that manatees change their behavior in general when a boat approaches closely, suggesting that in general they are able to detect boats and respond to them. We found that slow boats allow a manatee more time to change its behavior, and a mixture of lab and field studies both came to this conclusion. And then there's also the potential that fast boats can potentially mask the sound of closer boats. The majority of boat approaches in the DTAG field study were multiple boat approaches, meaning that when a boat is approaching a manatee, at least one other boat is audible. This creates an acoustically confusing environment, and we don't yet know how well manatees can tease apart 
overlapping broadband sounds. In other words, when there's multiple broadband sounds, how readily are they able to distinguish between those? So that's an important future area of study that would be a really significant piece to this puzzle. And there's this other interesting piece to the puzzle that um, we're starting to be able to address. And so I just want to share some kind of tidbits with it, tidbits on this because it's interesting. So an interesting follow up question would be to consider a manatee's history of exposure to boats. Does this affect the occurrence or timing of their changes in behavior? So we've established that Florida manatees are frequently exposed to boats, sometimes hundreds of boats a day, which brings up the question is, have they habituated to boat noise? Habituation occurs when repeated presentations of a stimulus over time results in a decrease or lack of response to that stimulus. So to kind of look for some tidbits to address this question, let's compare the response of Florida manatees to a population of manatees in an area with far less boat activity, Belize. Before the Florida DTAG study, there was a pilot study that used the DTAG in Belize on Antillean manatees. So Florida and Antillean manatees are subspecies of West Indian manatee, so closely related. Uh, they were able to deploy DTAGs on two manatees, however, the deployments were short, and also the, they weren't able to track down one of the manatees during it during the deployment. So it's a small sample size, but there's some really interesting findings. Now with the Belize data, there were four controlled boat of passes, passes for one of the Belize manatees. So this means we have a small sample size. So since there's only four Belize boat approaches for this comparison, it's important to compare them to acoustically similar Florida boat passes with similar circumstances. And six Florida boat passes match these criteria. So here we see the timing of first changes in behavior relative to a boat's, boat's closest point of approach. That red line is again indicating CPA with negative numbers indicating a change in behavior before the boat's closest point of approach. And what we found is that the Belize manatee responded much earlier relative to CPA. It's a really big difference. So even after applying a stringent filter to compare these small sample sizes, this actually was a statistically significant difference. When I was going through these data, there was also something that I found to be very striking. And that was how strong the response of the Belize manatees were to an approaching boat. So I decided to analyze a new parameter, triaxial acceleration. So the accelerometer in the DTAG measures acceleration in three orthogonal directions. So I took the root of the sum of the squares of the measurements in those three orientations, so X, Y, and Z. Now a peak in this parameter indicates a sudden change that may correspond to a startle response or something similar to a startle response. So here we have a boat pass from Belize with the spectrogram on top and triaxial acceleration below. And we can clearly see a startle-like response um, with that red circle. Very big difference. Right when that boat is close to the manatee, it has a startle-like response. So to compare this frequency to Florida manatees, I pulled out all of the Florida manatee single boat passes with similar circumstances within 50 meters of the manatee. And this yielded 44 passes. And what we found is that out of our four Belize passes, two of them had a startle, two of them didn't. Out of the Florida manatee boat passes, only one out of 44 exhibited this startle-like response. So again, this is a small sample size, but this is suggestive as a good launching point for future research, which is why we were planning to go back to Belize. <laughs> so, so, in the area of the previous DTAG work, there are still some areas that have very little boat traffic, but there's also areas where they're starting to be boat traffic. It's definitely not to the level of Florida boat traffic. In these Belize areas, it's generally single boat passes and not nearly as frequent. So this kind of presents these different natural laboratories where we have Florida with high boat traffic, we have areas of Belize that have very little boat traffic, and then areas of Belize with kind of an intermediate level where boats are starting to increase. Uh, so we had planned to pilot a new tag design on an Antillian manatee in Belize in May. However, 
as I'm sure you guys are familiar, we might have had some of your plans change as well. The pandemic has put our plans on hold, but hopefully stay tuned and we'll be able to talk more about that. Of course, there's an alternative to address the problem of boat collisions is we could just research Iron Man suits for manatees. It does, I acknowledge, present other problems, but it, it would help with the boat problem. <laughs> So this project is a result of work conducted by a lot of different agencies and researchers in addition to those who were already cited. So I, of course, want to acknowledge their efforts and thank them. And then for my question slide, I, I wanted to include a video of manatees. Whoops. So many of you have probably never seen manatees underwater. Even if you have seen a manatee in the wild, it was probably someplace where there's turbid water, so they were difficult to see, and you just see them from above. And from above in a turbid environment, they've just kind of look like a potato. If you actually go in the water with them, where you have good water clarity, you get a very different impression of manatees. Manatees spend, uh, manatees are gregarious. They like to hang out with each other relatively frequently. So they spend a little part of each day with other manatees. They follow each other around. They're very tactily engaged. <laughs> uh, they embrace each other. They're also very curious. So for example, a camera in their environment grabs their attention and they want to come over. And they're also for, uh, rather agile when they're in their element. All right, so thank you for your time. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. It is, um, even though we don't have manatees in our waters here, a lot of the same research is happening with some of our uh, whale species where we're looking at boat interactions. So I think we'll get some interesting questions. Um, it seems like we've got some things coming in. Do you want me to read them or do you want to read them out? Um, I can read them. All okay. right. So uh, the first question is about are manatees endangered? So the uh, in Florida, manatees were endangered. They were recently changed to threatened because they have had an increase in population over the last decade or two. Uh, so then you talk about the level of boat traffic indicates that Florida prioritizes human recreation over manatee survival. Is there any talk of creating an MPA or sanctuary zone? So there are actually lots of uh, limited boat speed zones throughout Florida, and there also are some manatee sanctuaries. So areas that are deemed to be particularly important are then completely off limits to boats. So we do have some of those protections in place, and they're also something that are reevaluated. So if there's an increase in manatee mortality from boat collisions, that triggers a reevaluation of that area. All right, next question. Yeah, so the next one we're looking at here says, has there been any research with manatee communication um, with each other, even in the presence of boats? Ah, so manatee vocal communication is such a fun topic. Um, and compared to a lot of other marine mammal species, we don't know nearly as much about manatee communi vocal communication. Uh, the primary use that we have so far determined is that they use sound between mothers and calves to keep in contact with one another. Uh, they also seem to use it to kind of um, facilitate um, groups of manatees coming together. If a manate another manatee is passing by, you might hear them exchange vocalizations and then one go to the other. As for their communication um, with respect to boat noise, I did some preliminary analyses of that, but I've greatly expanded my sample size since then. So I, I would hesitate to say anything about that. Kind of related to that, um, there's a question here that's talking about most of your work that you showed us today, at least, um, looks at an individual's response to boat noise. Has there been any work um, with animals that are in groups or pairs uh, mother calf, those kind of things to see how that might change their behavior? <laughs> um, so, yeah, and yeah. then there was a comment about yeah, I saw the Iron Man joke, for... yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Made um, me giggle as well. <laughs> Uh, so in our analysis, we, we didn't have enough mother-calf pairs because uh, we purposely tagged um, 
manatees that didn't have dependent calves with them because we didn't want to capture them. Um, so, but we did have manatees that were alone or in groups and we didn't see any differences, but it also didn't make it to our last round of uh, statistical analyses just for power concerns. So we don't necessarily have a, a, a good answer for that yet. Um, just while we're speaking about calves, one of the questions here is if you could expand on why young or small manatees are hit less often. Ah, so it's not that they're necessarily hit less often, it's that they're more vulnerable to other threats, particularly cold stress. Because of their small body size, they just can't handle the cold temperature nearly as well. So until they reach that adult size, they're disproportionately likely to die of cold stress. Okay. Um, and then again, another question a little bit related to age is, do we know if manatees lose their hearing as they age? That's an excellent question. Um, however, we only have audiograms for four manatees. <laughs> so can't really speak much to that. And they were actually, and they were pretty similar in hearing uh, sensitivity and frequencies. So not something we can really answer yet. <laughs> I have a question that I just want to add on to that. Is there any studies um, from manatees that have passed by strikes, whether there's been any damage to the um, hearing ability over time? That would be such a fantastic um, question if we could answer it. Because um, something that we did consider is could we do a uh, auditory brainstem response on manatees during captures to get at least a sense of their hearing capabilities. And that could then help us address that question, like are the ones that are getting hit, are they potentially ones that have worse hearing? But unfortunately, um, auditory brainstem response doesn't work well on manatees. Hmm. Um, okay, and then one more question about um, the strikes. Do sleepy manatees get struck more often? Do we know that? Uh, so we don't necessarily know for sure. Um, there's only been about 50 boat strikes where people have reported the details of it, and that seldom includes manatee behavior. So it's this, this challenging problem that manatees are getting hit often enough that it causes a problem for their population, but it's rare enough that we don't commonly actually see it. So we don't know for sure if sleeping manatees are more likely to get hit. We have seen that they, um, that their depth, which is indicative of if they're bottom resting, doesn't factor into whether or not they change their behavior. So we will see sleeping manatees that will actually respond to boats. Okay, so um, the, you might not be able to answer this question either, but do we know if uh, manatees that have been struck but have not died from that impact um, have a greater response to boat noise? Great question, but um, yeah, I can't think of any current data that would speak to that. We did have... Um, one of the manatees that we tagged actually had a recent boat strike. It was, it was already starting, to, it was a little raw. It had probably happened within maybe a week or two of our tagging. And we did try to carefully compare that manatee to the other ones in the group. A limited sample size, of course, trying to compare just one manatee. We didn't notice any differences between them, but with one manatee, we can't really speak beyond that. And this question kind of tags on to that as well. Do you have a sense about how much variability there is between individuals in behavioral response? Ah, so that's an excellent question. Um, so uh, two things. So one is that we see that pretty much every manatee, if it makes it to adulthood, is going to be hit by a boat. So it's not that there's kind of like a subgroup of manatees that are getting hit and other manatees that are just never hit. Is like there is, of course, a difference in the frequency within there, but we see that like once you reach a certain age, like chances are you've been hit by a boat. Um, the other thing is comparing between individuals is tricky. We, uh, we tagged 18 manatees, which isn't actually that much when you try to run statistical analyses. Um, there were differences. However, we were a little concerned that they might just be related more to the environment that they were in. Because, for example, some would hang out in like a little canal where there's no boats. Others might be like in a boat channel. Others might be on a beach. So we didn't really feel like we could tease apart both environmental kind of situational variables and individual differences. 
Um, and this last question that just came in, I think, um, speaks a little bit more to outreach and education. Is there a way that the public can report a manatee strike? Um, yes, uh, through FWC, that can be reported. If you either are involved in it or if you see it, you can report it. And having that information is incredibly important. Um, for one thing, it can help people actually go out and see if the manatee is okay. And then the other aspect that's really important is you might be able to share information, you know, like how fast was the boat going? What kind of boat was it? What was the water depth? Like all of that information would be incredibly valuable. Um, and then there's a question here about, um, can you speak a little bit about the challenges of getting permits to work on tagging manatees? Uh, so that's a, a really long process. Um, I was very fortunate to work with colleagues who had been um, capturing manatees on a regular basis for health assessments. So they had a long history of safely capturing manatees, bringing them on board, conducting health exams and releasing them and follow up data to support that the manatees readjusted well. So basically we joined those projects. So when the manatees were brought on board, we were able to attach our tag, but they were also going undergoing health assessments for a variety of other projects. But it does take a while to get the report to get the permits. Yeah. Um, well, I know that we are up against the time. And so I just want to encourage anybody who's on the line that has additional questions that they go ahead and reach out to Dr. Rissick directly. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. And if you're interested, you can join us same place, same time next week. Um, and we will keep these seminars going. And to our speaker today, thank you so much. Um, it's just really, it's one of the benefits of going to a virtual platform is we get to interact in a different way with folks that aren't just right um, here at Hatfield. And so I just really thank you for your time and energy to connect with us. Thank you. And I look forward to checking out some of those other talks I saw in your series. <laughs> Wonderful. You're always welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Have a good night.